So I think we're in a slow motion fiscal crisis. Um, I don't think, you know, a year from now, it's going to be particularly different, maybe even two years from now. Uh, But I do think over the next five plus years... Hello everyone, Lynn Alden, founder of Lynn Alden Investment Strategy, discusses the U.S. fiscal situation, monetary policy update, and asset allocation for the remainder of 2024. Subscribe now, hit that bell icon, and embark on an enriching journey toward financial success. Let's unlock the potential of these markets together and pave the way for a brighter financial future. Welcome aboard. I want to come back to the economy um, and talk about that in more detail. But you told me offline that suppose a Fed cut does come, it may not have significant impacts on the markets or economic growth. Is that is that my 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 paraphrasing right? Can you elaborate? Yeah, on that's that? that's my view. So uh, in this cycle, um, the economy has been more resilient than many expected uh, to rate hikes, um, and part of that is because I would argue that we are in fiscal dominance, which is to say that. Um, fiscal deficits annually are bigger than the amount of new bank loans per year, or even the amount of bank loans and corporate bond issuance on net uh, in a year. Uh, And so interest rates really serve two main purposes. One, um, they make your currency more attractive to uh, you know foreign holders, or they prevent domestic entities from fleeing to other currencies, like you might see in Japan, for example. So one is they they help stabilize your exchange rate, and two they can they can affect how much lending happens uh, in the economy. And for the past forty years, uh, money creation has been dominated by lending, um, but as we've gotten more into fiscal dominance. Lending is actually, a, in some ways, a smaller component of the economy than the fiscal deficits, um, and so and the and the federal debt is is generally fairly short duration. It's an average of like six years, um, but it goes from you know very short all up to to thirty years, and so it's pretty front loaded in the in the first uh, few years, um, and so the interest rates hikes increase their interest expense and their overall deficit. At a faster rate than it impacted homeowners and uh, investment grade corporations that, on average, locked in longer duration debt. Um, and the kind of the key emphasis I've been putting on is that if we cut rates a little bit, but we don't get a lower low, there's not that many mortgages that would want to refinance at those mildly lower rates because you know there's there's not been much mortgage volume. Uh, originations at these higher rates anyway. Um, there was a big refinancing wave back when they were very low. And so if we get like a higher low in interest rates for corporations, for mortgages, um, that only has a moderate effect on kind of stimulating um, you know, parts of the economy. The areas where it would be more impactful are you know, small businesses that rely on bank lending, um, but again, only around the margins if we're talking about three cuts or something like that. Um, it would affect obviously, you know, commercial real estate. Uh, I think it would impact emerging markets because if you soften the dollar a little bit, um, those countries with dollars on mid debt have a little bit more breathing room. Um, so it's not that it's not impactful, um, but I think a higher low in interest rates, kind of like how we had a higher high in interest rates this time, uh, would would give us just overall less stimulation on the economy than than. Most people think. So ultimately, do you think the Fed will cut by September? Uh, so I don't disagree with current market pricing. I think there's a pretty high chance that they will, um, but I'm not super high conviction on it because if we get if we get a month or two of uh, things that are not as soft um, as they were a couple months ago, then I can also see them pushing it off. I think that, but I think my main view is that whether we get a 25 basis point cut in September is not really going to affect any of my key investment decisions. So I think then the assumption is that the markets, the stock markets are pricing in lower inflation and I guess um, a lower chance of significant deterioration in the labor market by September in the next two months. Is that fair to say? I think they expect to see the trend continuing, but from still a fairly strong base. Because if you expect to see substantial um labor weakness, then you probably would expect faster rate cuts than just you know a 25 basis point cut here, another 25 basis point cut here. Markets tend toward um, being moderate in the sense that they don't want to price in rapid outcomes. Historically, when the Fed cuts, they tend to get pretty aggressive pretty quickly because they're usually cutting in response to fairly bad economic data. 
Um, now, in this case, they're cutting from a very high level in response to an inflation spike, which is different than most of the past 40 years. So it's more possible that they could have mild cuts uh, that would still be somewhat historically unusual, um, you know, in our investment lifetimes. Um, you know, my overall expectation is that they will probably have a higher low in interest rates in this cycle, um, whether it starts in September, whether it starts in the next meeting, whether it starts in early 2025. I don't have a very high conviction other than to say that I, I think there's too much attention placed on those details. Suppose they do cut by September. That would be the first rate cut since 2020. I think the question people have is how that will impact the markets. Do you have a view on that? Uh, so I, it depends how surprising that is. I mean, a lot of that will be priced in based on what the market's already looking at. Um, that's not, not, you know, we're seeing kind of a range bound dollar index, for example, because the market's kind of pricing in, you know, not super dovishness, but some degree of cuts uh, in the foreseeable future. Um, and so I, I think basically where that would impact is decently beneficial for certain emerging markets, decently beneficial for some of the more cyclical um, side of the economy. Um, in my view, less relevant for the the you know the very large uh, companies, um, and not particularly relevant for the majority of the real economy, especially when we're talking about you know less than a full percentage points of interest rate cuts. The last two times they cut, so back in uh, 2008, and then in 2020 they cut all the way back down to zero. So I think some people wondering whether or not that's going to happen again down to zero. So it's possible, but I think that with these with the size of these structural fiscal deficit uh, that we have now, as well as uh, some of the, the frictions in, say, global supply chains and kind of competing great power uh, narratives and, you know, views around reshoring, I think that inflation on average is more likely to air above 2%. Uh, than below two percent. Um, you know, back in the 2010s, they were ironically lamenting that they couldn't reliably get you know inflation the way they measure it above two percent. Um, you know, now the 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 stickiness might be on the other side of that, um, and so I do think we could see a higher low in rates, which means you know maybe we go back down to three percent or two percent, but I, I think it's going to be harder to get back down to zero percent, um, which I think is it's, uh, many weighs a good thing because there should be a cost of capital. Um, basically, capital in the present should have a different cost than capital in the future in most healthy markets. This is a tweet from uh, Balaji Srinivasan, former CTO of Coinbase. He said that the Western world is headed for a sovereign debt crisis far worse than 2008. Just like they've been lying about Biden's senility, they've also been lying about the economy, and so they've been going to print a lot of money. But that, but take a look at the data and judge for yourself. Pretty strong statement. I'm just using that as an example of some sentiment that's being echoed um, in the broader financial, um, you know, community. What is your take on this issue? So I think we're in a slow motion fiscal crisis. Um, I don't think. You know, a year from now, it's going to be particularly different. Maybe even two years from now, uh, but I do think over the next five plus years, um, this is a long, drawn out um, fiscal issue. Um, back in two thousand eight, that wasn't a sovereign debt crisis; that was a private sector uh, debt crisis. Uh, and then a few years later, after that, Europe did have a sovereign debt crisis. But when you have a sovereign debt crisis in a very deflationary um, era, um, printing money kind of fixes it, and those consequences are. Uh, not as immediately apparent. Um, but when you have um, overall kind of larger deficits, uh, more structural background inflation, fewer inflationary offsets, like, you know, China in the 2010s was a very deflationary force on global manufacturing, for example. And even though they still are, the rate of change is not what it what it once was. It's kind of like a lot of that low-hanging fruit has already been picked. We've already done a lot of that offshoring. And if anything, it's a political issue to try to reshore some things now. Um, and so where you can run into what what would be more publicly perceived as a crisis is if you have these ongoing debt and deficit issues on the public ledger um, while you have high inflation. Because if, if central banks have to end up accommodating um, those deficits, and th that's kind of how this always works at the end of the day, um, you could get stuck with above target inflation and then everybody complaining about it, which makes it more of a political crisis. And you could get like the emerging marketification of some of these key developing market currencies, which is that it doesn't mean that everything blows up in a year or a few years, but it means you're stuck in this kind of hot environment of 
debasement happening at a rate that that most would consider unacceptable. Uh, generally speaking, what is your sentiment or outlook for fixed income, uh, the bond markets? Um, are we going to get, uh, you know, we had bad years for the bond market in the last couple of years. Um, you know, people are wondering if that's going to turn around. So I think it looks decent in nominal terms, maybe over the next year. Right, which is to say that um, everybody got super bared up on bonds, um, and now there are some of these cooling factors that we talked about before, potential for cuts. Um, so you could get, you know, some decent improvement in in kind of the two year, the the middle of the curve. Uh, you kind of I have less conviction about the long end of the curve that might even steepen. No, no particular opinion, um, but in real terms, looking over a multi year period. Um, I, I don't find bonds compelling at all. Um, basically, the math uh, for the sovereign debt does not really work on a real basis on a prolonged period of time. So if you look at a 10-year treasury, uh, when you look 10 years out in advance, the, the idea that they can maintain positive real rates um, for a decade and kind of make those bonds worthwhile on a real basis, on a real purchasing power basis for kind of scarce assets that we want to buy I, I view them as undesirable. I think there's I think there's much better assets out there. I do think T bills, you know, cash equivalents are useful for volatility reduction, you know, kind of um, short or mid duration tips, you know, can have a place in a portfolio. But um, I, I think there are better things than bonds for the most part. Yeah, what are those things? Because I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you told me in the past that you see longer term uh, equity returns to be, um, I guess, not as significant as the past decade, right? So if we're, if we're assuming lower term, uh, lower long term growth in equities, and I guess in bonds, where do we go? So I think that um, equ so equities can be separated from the S and P five hundred, which is that um, there are plenty of inexpensive companies with earnings yields of of eight or ten percent that are also growing at a, at maybe a mild pace um, that I think can give. You know, notably better returns than Treasuries over the next five ten years. Uh, you know, I'm not sure that the you know that the mild growth, large caps that are trading at 50 times earnings. You know, they're they're not exactly what I want to buy. Uh, I, I think it's kind of a coin flip how they do relative to Treasuries, um, but certainly you know more recently valued cash flow businesses I think are better than Treasuries. Um, I think there are opportunities in select emerging markets, particularly parts of Latin America. Um, uh, I think that uh, the energy sector is interesting long term. Um, I would certainly can. Uh, consider having a slice of gold in a portfolio uh, and take out at least part of the slice of bonds um, and and Bitcoin I mean there's and there's there's kind of multiple asset classes that I would go to before I would I would overweight bonds thank you for watching the interview highlights of Lynn Alden if you enjoy this highlight video please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content thank you